Hi everyone, Sean here, Service Manager with Angstrom Engineering. Welcome to another Angstrom How-To. Today we're going to talk about troubleshooting a loss of base pressure. One of the common inquiries I receive from customers is that they've lost their base pressure. Now this may mean that the tool is actually pumping, but that the base pressure is higher than it was before. In some cases, this could represent a leak, or it could represent a problem with the gauge. When troubleshooting a loss of base pressure, I usually recommend a certain sequence of things to check, uh, from sort of most common to least common, that users can work their way through in order to see if they can find the cause of the leak. In the comments, we'll provide a link to a document that you can use to work your way through these sequence of items. It's important in all cases to investigate what may have happened before the loss of base pressure. In some cases we may find that uh, there's been some maintenance performed on the tool for example. Debris shields have been changed or foil has been added to the debris shields. They may have uh, introduced something new into the chamber, a feed through or um, a new holder they've changed their process and the coating on the holder or the coating on the substrate has changed or maybe even it's a new material or they've changed the way they're cleaning items and in some cases this can make a difference perhaps during the deposition they've run out of material and the sources ran at a very high power where some damage may have occurred with resistive sources for example we see that the o-rings can become damaged on the chamber um, sputter sources can overheat and cause uh, leaks from vacuum to air or even water leaks. So in all cases I encourage users to put on their detective hat and go to it. If we believe that the loss of base pressure is caused by an actual leak, one of the first things I suggest checking are the door seals. Door seals can be wiped clean with uh, a clean room cloth and isopropyl alcohol can visually inspect them to make sure that there isn't any signs of damage. Most of the O-rings that we have on doors, especially on glove box doors, have a little bit of grease on them. That's there primarily so that the door doesn't stick. Um, most of the O-rings that we use are actually joined together in sections, so in some cases they may have one or two joints that you can inspect to make sure they're not split. On some occasions we do see that the o-ring will separate and this will cause a leak. It's actually quite rare that we do have to replace the o-rings. They do tend to just need to be wiped clean. In some cases you'll find uh, Kapton tape is very common or a little bit of foil, some hair, some particulate uh, is across the o-ring causing a conductance path, causing a leak. It's more challenging to do a glove box door where access inside the glove box itself is challenging and you can't use any solvents. So you can simply dry wipe, work your way around the edge of the door as best you can to see if you can catch any particulate that may have been stuck to the o-ring itself. One thing to be aware of, if you do need to take the o-ring out or you want to change the o-ring itself, uh, it's very important to understand that a screwdriver not be used to remove an o-ring. If you go in and you pry with a screwdriver underneath an o-ring, in most cases you're going to scratch the seal face behind the o-ring and effectively you're going to cause a leak instead of looking for or repairing a leak. So no screwdrivers allowed. You can use something plastic, a uh, credit card, I use typically the end of a swab to pry out the o-ring from the groove and you can pull it out, wipe it, wipe the back side. Uh, seal face, reapply a small amount of grease to the o-ring itself after it's been inspected and, and replace it in the chamber face or the chamber door depending on where the o-ring might be. Sometimes it's difficult to understand whether the loss of base pressure is actually real or not. In some cases we may understand that we may have a leak and the pressure values are higher because it's a leak in some cases we may understand that there's another issue that's driving up the pressure or we may understand that the gauge itself is not actually reading the pressure correctly. On some of the gauges that we use 
will find that one of the portions of the gauge will stop working. Most of the gauges that we see, like this MPG 400 cold cathode, have actually two gauges inside. There's a brawny gauge here that measures from atmosphere to the minus three or minus four range, and then the cold cathode itself, which measures from that minus three, minus four, down to effectively minus nine if the chamber can pump that low. If the cold cathode, for example, is dirty, it can change the way the gauge reads. Typically, we'll see one of two things. The gauge will only read down to the limit of the Pirani in the minus three, minus four range and get stuck there. Or the gauge may read in the minus five to minus six Tor range and also get stuck there. Now that's harder to sort of determine, but these gauges in some cases will get contaminated with material and not read correctly below that minus five or minus six threshold. But it's usually very obvious if they're not reading below the minus three or minus four range and that the cold cathode is not turning on at all. We have a how-to video that explains how to clean a cold cathode and specifically this MPG 400. And in a lot of cases, simply cleaning the gauge restores its functionality and restores the base pressure. On older tools, we have uh, a different gauge from Granville Phillips, the 390, which is very similar. It's a multi-modular um, gauge that has actually three gauges in it. Uh, they use a convection gauge to measure down to that minus three, minus four range the same way. And then there's a hot filament, uh, hot ionization gauge that measures down into the lower vacuum levels down effectively to minus 10. And in some cases, if the filaments have failed, the gauge will get stuck again in that minus three or minus four range. And we know that simply replacing a module in the gauge will restore its functionality. The next item on the list for checking uh, if we believe we have a leak in terms of uh, possibility for leakage being the cause of our base pressure loss. Uh, on cryo pump tools like this, we have uh, a rough valve and a four line valve. In both cases, usually similar construction. Um, typically, these valves can in some cases ingest either some charcoal from the cryo pump, which is relatively rare, or some other bit of particulate uh, from the chamber, especially where we may be using foil. Uh, small bits of foil can be sucked through and get caught in the valve itself. Um, one simple method for checking to see if you have a leak on a rough valve or a four-line valve is to simply have the chamber pumping uh, have the gate valve open in this case, and then turn on the rough pump. So if you have uh, a scroll pump, for example, where the scroll pump will lose the vacuum on the vacuum side of the valve uh, when it's off, if you turn the pump back on, we lower the pressure on the atmosphere side of the valve, and it'll show up as a decrease in the chamber pressure. This is a really simple way to check to see if either of these valves are leaking. Now, if you do believe that they are leaking, they're relatively easy to disassemble and clean. There's a couple ways to do it. Most of these valves are a similar construction where they'll have a bonnet, they'll have three or four screws on the bonnet, and typically there's a bellows here that's gonna seal towards the cryo or the chamber there's some spring tension on the bellows. So when you take them apart, it's important to hold the valve together and then simply undo the screws and it'll come apart. The guts basically pull out. You have a bellows inside with a seal on the end that seals on the bottom of the valve. And then you can simply clean inside the valve body itself and clean the O-ring off and reassemble it. Now, typically there is an O-ring on the bellows inside that you have to make sure is lined up to seal the bellows to the body. In a lot of cases, that O-ring will actually just stay in place on the bellows. And so if you just simply pull it out, clean the seal on the end, clean the seal inside, and pop it back together, that's all you need to do. There is another way that you can clean these valves. On our tools, for example, you can use manual mode to turn the rough pump on, but if you unplug it, you won't have any vacuum 
on the atmosphere side of the valve. And then the software will allow you to manually open the valve. And then you can use a swab and simply come in the side of the valve and wipe the seal face because the valve is actually open and the seal will be exposed. And you can usually get down and wipe the seal face inside the valve as well. It's a real quick and easy way to clean them without having to take them apart. Um, certainly it's more effective to remove the guts and clean that way. I would recommend taking the valve apart and that it does tend to be a little bit more thorough in terms of making sure that you do catch all the particulate inside. But if you want to just do a quick clean, you can just open it and clean inside through the side port with a swab. Chamber vent valves or cryo purge valves are the next item on the list. On the majority of the tools now in service, we have filters on the inlet side of the tool for vent and purge gases, so that it is relatively rare that these valves will ingest any particulate that causes them to leak. It can happen if there was particulate in the line uh, that enters the gas line and gets stuck in the valve. Depending on the age of the tool, we may not have filters on the inlet side as well, and they are more prone to seeing uh, issues with particulate in the valves. Most of our older tools use the same style of valve for purging and venting. Typically, they look like the valve shown here. On some of the newer tools, we use a vent valve that is effectively the same construction as a rough valve, and the cleaning for those would be similar to the instructions for cleaning rough valves outlined previously. Sometimes we find on resistive sources where a user has perhaps made a mistake in their recipe or the sources run out of material that the deposition has ran very long or at a very high power for a long enough duration of time that the o-rings on the posts have become damaged. This is where we tie back into that sort of investigative nature into what may have happened before the loss of base pressure. But one thing I like to suggest to check is to see what deposition was ran last, especially on a resistive tool. We can focus on that particular source location and simply check to see if the posts have a problem. One thing we suggest is to simply remove the boat or source from the resistive location and then grab the post by hand and see if you can twist it. If the o-rings have been overheated or melted, in most cases the, the post will be loose, in some cases very loose, and this is going to be the cause of the loss of base pressure, it's going to be the cause of a leak. Uh, and these are relatively easy to repair to resolve the issue. I've had pictures of the O-ring actually sprayed out on the base plate. So they've heated it up so much that the O-ring actually liquefies and then because you have a leak, the air comes in and blows the material onto the base plate. It's quite dramatic. But in most cases, no. In most cases it's just that the post is loose um, and you can turn it and you don't need to use any tools or anything like that. You basically just go in and grab it by hand. The, the sort of previous version to this where the clamp is a bit longer uh, is easier. You get more purchase on it and it's easier to twist and in a lot of cases they will move enough that you know that that o-ring just isn't making a good seal anymore. Next item on the list is uh, water leakage internally in the chamber. In some cases we'll find that E-beams or sputter sources can leak internally and cause an issue with base pressure. Usually the cause on an E-beam is the quad seal, so the seal underneath the hearth that seals vacuum to water can be compromised. There's a couple ways that that can happen. In some cases the seal just gets old. In some cases the water quality may be very poor um, and the particulate in the water works its way beside the seal. Uh, in a lot of cases we can find material may have fallen in beside the hearth and pushed the hearth sideways 
when the hearth is rotated. And basically the shaft inside pushes sideways on the seal and allows water to come through between the seal and the shaft. And normally, this is manifested by uh, a puddle. You'll actually see water forming underneath the source itself. So it's very visual, it's very easy to open the door and have a look and see if there's evidence that you have water inside the chamber. Spider sources are the same, they can be overheated and in some cases will create a leak uh, water to vacuum and also vacuum to air. But water to vacuum is going to be easier to see. Again, you would see water on the side of the source or water pooled below the source itself indicating that water is coming into the chamber from the source, again typically from overheating. One of the next items to check, uh, in some cases we do see issues where the viewports on the chamber or the glass that we use for the feed through for the light in the chamber, uh, specifically on tools that are on glove boxes, almost all of those will have a light can in some cases crack or break. In some cases they may be just under too much stress, in some cases they may be thermally affected, but occasionally we will see where they will crack or break and this can cause a leak air to vacuum. So It's easy to simply inspect the viewport from the outside or the inside or both just to make sure that there's no visible cracking. You can sometimes see down around the edge to where the seal or the o-ring that's used to seal the glass is touching the glass and ensure that there's no breakage or uh, signs of cracking in that area. The light glass can be inspected from inside the chamber. In some cases you may need to remove the debris shield or use a mirror to be able to see the light glass effectively. One of the least common but possible sources of a leak are water-cooled stages. In some cases we find on older tools that they will spring a small leak in the rotary on top of the chamber in the stage itself. This in some cases can go on undetected uh, if the leak is really small and the water will slowly infiltrate the rotary feed through that's used to translate rotary motion from air or atmosphere to vacuum on the stage itself. These are certainly worth checking regardless of whether you have a leak or not on older tools um, in that in some cases they go completely undetected until they fail. In a lot of cases we see they're diagnosed because the stage will stop rotating due to oxidation taking place on the rotary itself and in investigating why it's not turning, the oxidation will be found um, and also uh, you know, this may show as a leak into the chamber at the same time or uh, be the cause of the leak. So, Although less common, it's certainly worth checking if you have a water-cooled stage or a stage that has any sort of fluid cooling to make sure that there are no leaks that could cause a uh, compromise in air to vacuum on the rotary on top of the stage. Turbos on turbo pumped chambers require the backing pump to be working well in order to be able to achieve a good base pressure. If we have any concerns with the rough pump at all in terms of the performance or if we have a leak on the backside perhaps in a roughing line um, it will show up as an increase in base pressure in the chamber itself. On tools that use a rotary vane it's less common but on tools where we have scroll pumps the tips in the scroll pumps tend to wear on a regular basis. Um, you'll get perhaps a year just over a year of use continuously from a scroll pump before in most cases they need some service and that wear manifests itself as an increase in the backing pressure or the four line pressure to the turbo and this will sh sort of show up if you will as a higher base pressure. It'll also show up 
in the power that the turbo is using to, to maintain its speed. So in a lot of cases we can look at a controller or a computer interface to the turbo itself to monitor the power that the turbo is using and understand that if that power level is a little bit high that it indicates that we have a problem with something on the backing side or the four line side of the turbo itself. If you have a scroll pump as a backing pump and you're seeing that your base pressure is a little high, uh, consider overhauling or replacing the seal tips in the pump itself if they haven't been done in a long time. Uh, in most cases it's, it's sort of important to keep track of the interval for replacement and you may be able to preempt problems by replacing those tip seals or having the pump uh, maintained on a regular basis. It's also worthwhile to check the fittings, the hoses, the clamps to make sure that everything's tight, that something hasn't come loose. In some cases we'll actually see the rough lines themselves may have a problem where the internal walls of the rough line will collapse, causing uh, basically the four line to be choked off and then your effective four line pressure is higher and, and again your effective base pressure becomes higher in the chamber. So it's important to, to go through and have a look at these items to make sure that they're all in good shape, that everything's tight and everything is functioning properly. To understand that this may or may not be the cause of an increase in your base pressure. If we've eliminated all the possibilities for leaks in the chamber, we can look at backside leaks on the cryo pump as a possible cause. There's basically four points of entry into a cryo pump to check. One is going to be the four line valve that we've spoken about before. One is going to be the gate valve. In some cases gate valves will leak, but you won't necessarily see that in the performance of the base pressure. You'd see it more in the temperature of the pump being higher because when the chamber is vented, we would be leaking into the cryo pump causing typically the pressure or the temperature in the pump to increase. Well, normally, when the tool is at idle and the valve is closed, the temperature in the cryo will actually decrease slightly. If we have a leak on the gate valve, the opposite is true. As we refill the chamber with atmosphere, it'll leak through into the cryo pump and the temperature in the pump will actually increase. The third item to check on the cryo pump is going to be the overpressure valve. Now in most cases we have a cover that allows us to plumb the gases that are expelled from the pump during a regeneration. So in order to inspect the valve we need to remove that cover. We've got four screws. So there is a small o-ring on the back of this cover and the screws like to run away. It's important to note that if you do want to clean the overpressure valve, you need to actually turn the pump off and purge it, refill it with gas to atmospheric pressure. And then these valves can be cleaned in two different ways. You can actually remove the entire valve by unscrewing it. It makes it easier to work on. There is an O-ring here. You can see on the modern pumps, they actually have a little filter. So it's relatively rare that we see charcoal or particulate from the pump getting into the seal on the valve itself. Sometimes we see these are omitted on older pumps or pumps that have been rebuilt. The seal we're concerned about is on the valve itself. This valve, you can push open with your finger and see the seal here. It's easy to wipe inside with a clean room cloth to remove any particulate and you can clean the top of the valve with a swab as well. The static o-ring is usually fine and then the valve can be reinstalled onto the pump. Reinstall the cover on the valve when you're done cleaning. The fourth item on the cryo pump 
is the purge valve that we've already discussed. So you've gone through all the steps in your investigation and you haven't had any success finding out why you have a loss of base pressure. At this point, depending on what you're able to achieve for pressure in your chamber, you might want to consider the use of a helium leak detector or an RGA to try and search the rest of the chamber to determine whether there's a leak or not. If you don't have access to a helium leak detector or an RGA, you may find that there are services available locally that uh, you can employ to come in and help to find a leak for you. In some cases, we may be able to make some recommendations for you in terms of who to contact in your area. This usually is the last step, but it may be the only way to determine where you may have a leak if this is what we suspect is the cause of your base pressure loss. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're here to help.